thank you everyone who's watching uh for your attention i think it's amazing that so many of you are, are choosing to watch an educational video like this in your spare time and it's very humbling that you're watching an educational video from me so this is on pregnenolone dhea and thyroid as you can see from the title uh in the book i also do cover estrogen hcg and fertility but when i presented the full seminar at the olympia it was about an hour 15 and it was pretty dry and long in the teeth so we're going to do this one today as a part one to go in depth on these three topics if you'd like more information on these hormones that haven't really been covered in this uh seminar i do have a bunch of youtube videos which do cover the more nitty-gritty of the science and all of this content plus more elaboration on each topic will be available in beyond trt which is coming out very soon so i'm just going to get into this i'm not going to spill too much of my intro because that about me stuff is boring no one cares but just a little bit of a, a short background is i'm a health coach from australia uh, i've been working in this space now uh, full time and beyond for the last three years and these have become areas of specialty for me my kind of my thing is helping to troubleshoot problematic trt cases and this is a lot of what i've learned from being in the trenches for so long uh, and also inheriting a lot of clients that have maybe had a negative experience at another clinic or with another doctor and i unscrew them up firstly why are we talking about this so here's the sales pitch that many guys get from their terrible clinics which is you know take this testosterone get your blood work we'll adjust the dose we'll get it right you'll be dialed in and bob's your uncle you're all good it sounds great but it almost never works that simply it does for a lot of guys but for the rest of the guys it can be more complex it can be diet it can be lifestyle some guys need to get some counseling some guys need some time to let things settle but unfortunately many patients and practitioners believe this one very simple fallacy which is that testosterone is the panacea for all problems tired lethargic depressed anxious more test bloated emotional overstimulated not sleeping drop the dose and then we'll find the sweet spot and everything will be perfect in your life it's not that simple so there are many misconceptions around the impact of testosterone replacement therapy surrounding the endocrine system so many men will not just require testosterone replacement therapy but comprehensive hormone replacement therapy there's a key variable which i think is very important here which is identifying what was the root cause of the low testosterone in the first place if a man has got primary hypogonadism it may be isolated some forms of secondary hypogonadism might also be isolated but if there are issues with signaling the endocrine glands from the pituitary there is also a good chance that where there's smoke there's fire and there could be other issues going on with other hormonal systems so there's four key concepts I want to go through. There's two on here and two on the next side before anyone gets smart. So if you have a testosterone deficiency, you may have other hormonal deficiencies too. So testosterone deficiency can occur in isolation in some people, while hormone deficiencies may also occur together in others. This is a very important note. Not everyone needs pregnenolone, DHEA, thyroid, et cetera, but some people do. Not everyone just needs testosterone replacement therapy but some people do. So it's very important that everything's case by case and you're assessed by someone competent who can go through everything, take a good look at all your blood work and actually get to the bottom of where your symptoms are coming from. And that's one of the reasons why Marik Health is such a fantastic clinic. So if the root cause of hypogonadism is secondary, which means that it's not related to failure of the testicles themselves, the root cause of this, this dysfunction, so what caused the low testosterone in the first place, ideally needs to be resolved whether that's with the support of testosterone replacement therapy or potentially it may not be needed the individual may not need trt so not everyone responds to trt the same and while there are averages and there are trends absolutely there's a large deviation away from the norm in response to dose and outcome so your individual timeline your symptomatic improvement and your overall outcomes may actually have nothing in common with the status quo so it's important to understand that you can be an outlier. Our biochemical individuality, which is the combination of our different genetics and years of living with different inputs and outputs as human beings, we've all lived very different lives up to the point that we start TRT, means that comparing two men on TRT is like comparing apples to oranges. They're both fruit, absolutely, but they're just as different as they are similar. So I'm going to go through some basic TRT stuff here, just as an overall premise before we get into this stuff. I am going to talk pretty quick because I've got a lot to get through. So testosterone replacement th therapy can be physiological or supraphysiological at the same dose and the same level, depending on the patient's individual health status. So 
This whole idea that one certain number for TRT is physiological and one is super physiological based on a number that people come up with is nonsense because a level that is perfectly optimal for a healthy 20 year old is going to be super physiological for a obese alcoholic 70 year old. It's two very different circumstances. So what is physiological for one individual has a lot to do with age and baseline health status. So TRT causes estrogenic side effects in men who have not resolved the root cause of their secondary hypogonadism as they are flooding the body with androgens, which the body is actively suppressing. So this is a bit of a controversial take that summarizes a lot of what goes on with troubleshooting. When you get into the trenches and you health coach guys through this day in, day out, seeing thousands of guys for years, is that what you find is that when a man doesn't tolerate his optimal testosterone dose and gets these side effects, we point the finger at estrogen. But in reality, what's happening is that we have upgraded the car's engine, but we have not serviced the rest of the vehicle. So if you have a whole bunch of diet and lifestyle problems, which have led to you being hypergonadal, and then you flood your body with a bunch of androgens that your body is actively suppressing, it is illogical to think that that's just going to work out fantastically and everything's going to be hunky-dory. It doesn't happen. And that's the most important thing is this is just what happens in reality. But it's very important that when we're working with clients or if you are a patient on TRT, to understand that you need to meet the medicine halfway. You need to get yourself back on track to be able to get the best outcomes from your testosterone. It's not just going to do it for you. So secondly, I'm sorry, that was what I was just covering here. So the body is not enzymatically equipped or at a receptor le level to actually receive and utilize optimal male androgen levels if you are living a suboptimal unhealthy lifestyle. So testosterone replacement therapy can be used as a catalyst to help you get your shit together but it's important that you do get said shit together. So optimizing TRT, in my opinion, is not rocket science. A lot of the time, we just need to increase the injection frequency, titrate up the dose a little bit, give it eight to 12 weeks, titrate it down if we need to, or you can use a high potency topical transcrotal cream, particularly in obese men, the, the, cream sends tea, uh, the cream tends to yield less side effects, but it can be patient to patient. But what's very important to understand with this is that if you are having side effects relating to your TRT protocol, then fixing your injection frequency or dose will fix those side effects. But daily subcutaneous injections and getting the optimal TRT dose will not fix the side effects that come from a poor diet and lifestyle or years and years and years of psychological programming that you need to work through with someone. Testosterone is not an intoxicant. It's not just going to completely change all your thought patterns for you. It will help you do that work. But a lot of the time, there needs to be some form of psychological adjustment as well. Testosterone replacement therapy is not just a drug that's going to change your, your brain and your, your mind completely. So many issues on TRT extend, extend beyond TRT, which is the name of the book, the protocol itself, and often involve other root cause issues, either occurring alongside or as a result of the prolonged state of hypogonadism. So we're going to start with pregnenolone. So pregnenolone is one of the most misunderstood and under and over prescribed medications in men's TRT. That is a contradiction. So what I mean by that is it is often thrown at everyone inappropriately who doesn't need it, or the guys who do need it are not tested for it, and their symptoms are not identified as a pregnenolone deficiency, and they're losing out on actually fixing the problem. The majority of young men on TRT do not have pregnenolone deficiencies. That is the fact of the matter. I have done thousands of these tests and I've had thousands of guys come to me with their tests from my YouTube videos. And I do know that Marrick Health actually include pregnenolone on their lab work, which is very rare. We can't test it in Australia anymore. A lot of countries in Europe can't test it either. But when you do run pregnenolone testing on a bunch of guys on TRT, it's actually more, much more common for them not to have deficiencies especially when they're young. If you're dealing with an older population who are in their 60s and 70s as your bread and butter, you're probably going to have far more pregnenolone deficiencies because one of the main factors for a pregnenolone deficiency is age. And a lot of content on TRT, a lot of the educational content and the perspectives are around andropause, which is this idea of testosterone declining as we get older. But a lot of the time when we're dealing with these younger guys, the pregnenolone is not the problem, and there's actually detriments to adding in extra amounts of pregnenolone when the body doesn't need it. It doesn't receive it well. So 
one thing that's very important to note is that TRT does not cause a systemic shutdown of pregnenolone production, irrespective of whether you use HCG or not. It doesn't. If it did, every man on TRT would be deficient in pregnenolone. But what's very important to understand why this doesn't happen is that luteinizing hormone is one of, is one of but not the only factor for initiating the conversion from cholesterol into pregnenolone. This is an enzyme called CYP11A1. And pregnenolone is a factor for inducing that. Sorry, luteinizing hormone is, but it's not the only one. So there's three key facts to look at here. So as I said before, I've done this a lot. I've looked at pregnenolone a lot. And mechanistic theory doesn't mean shit if it doesn't actually eventuate in reality. So firstly, when you go outside and see the sky is blue, in reality, there's just not that many pregnenolone deficiencies that we do see, but they do occur. So the idea that everyone on TRT needs to take pregnenolone is incorrect. Secondly, if pregnenolone is slightly reduced on TRT, which is not the same as inducing a full-blown symptomatic deficiency, it actually makes sense because when we're putting testosterone replacement therapy in, we're actually fulfilling one of the end roles of the process of steroidogenesis, which is converting cholesterol into all the hormones in the sex hormone cascade, as well as corticosteroids. So if you're putting in testosterone, which by extension will also you know, convert to DHT and estrogens, your body isn't going to need the same amount of pregnenolone and the body has negative feedback systems. So it's normal for it to reduce a small amount, but that is very different from it inducing a deficiency. Lastly, the majority of men who I've worked with who've trialed pregnenolone based on the things I've seen on the internet or that they've just you know spoken to their practitioner about, in any dose, whether it's five milligrams, 50 milligrams, 100 milligrams, two milligrams when they can microdose it, in the absence of low pregnenolone levels, report negative side effects. This is just what happens. So pregnenolone and pregnenolone sulfate, as well as its metabolite allopregnenolone, which sits downstream from progesterone, play key roles in balancing GABA and glutamate neurologically. So this is called a neurosteroid. So it also modulates neural inflammation. So it acts as an antioxidant as well and an anti-inflammatory. And it does modulate, it acts as a marionette, which is like a puppet master of various neurotransmitter production signals. So pregnenolone deficiencies are very common in older men as pregnenolone declines with age, as well as DHEA, testosterone, T3, growth hormone, melatonin as well. But pregnenolone deficiencies can also be caused by head trauma and psychological trauma. So PTSD and head trauma can both induce pregnenolone deficiencies. So if these are part of your medical history, particularly if you're a veteran and you were around a lot of explosions or you've been concussed a lot playing professional sport or just got knocked out a bunch doing whatever, it's very important to look into this, particularly if you have negative symptoms. So these are the things that come up in practice when we're looking at a pregnenolone deficiency. The, the big one is anxiety and insomnia, which is a terrible combination. You can't sleep and your mind keeps you awake. It can be quite torturous. A low threshold to physical or psychological stress, including fibromyalgia. Not every fibromyalgia case is a pregnenolone deficiency. Hypersensitivity to stimulants and THC. I put THC in here particularly because uh, pregnenolone is what's called a CB1 receptor negative allosteric modulator. It tunes down the sensitivity to THC. So being hypersensitive to THC does not mean that you have a pregnenolone deficiency, but it does come up in a trend of symptoms, uh, particularly if it started occurring after a head trauma or a particularly traumatic event. Inability to relax and focus, can't switch off, can't focus on what you want to focus on, anxious, mind racing, horrible situation to be in. A constant feeling of malaise, overstimulation, and cranked. I like the word cranked. It sounds like you've got too much bad energy. It's like the side effects from caffeine. It's not good. Wired and tired. Debilitating brain fog, reduced verbal acuity. I usually stutter. Ah, I did it again. I usually stutter on talking about verbal acuity every time. Memory loss, that's a big one as well. But again, these things are not things that mean you have a pregnenolone deficiency. A whole bunch of other stuff can cause this. And anhedonic depression, meaning you don't feel the pleasure and the enjoyment of doing things that you should enjoy. So if you take too much pregnenolone, this is what happens. So we get an anti-androgenic cascade of events due to overconversion to progesterone. So progesterone in physiological levels is very, very important for men for a lot of functions, just like testosterone is important for women. 
But when we get supraphysiological amounts of progesterone in men, it acts as a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. So this will negatively impact your androgen signaling, and it will move the dial in the wrong direction away from what you're trying to optimize with your testosterone. So it's quite common for guys to start TRT, get a bunch of benefits, take some pregnenolone, and then the needle moves in the wrong direction. So reoccurrence of hypogonadal symptoms, immune system dysregulation, like rashes, congested sinuses, insurmountable fatigue, needing to nap all the time always napping, can't get enough sleep, always tired. People will be like, yeah, I'm relaxed, I'm super chill, but you can't get anything done because you're just so wrecked. Bloating and water retention, gummy worm dick, also known as Deca dick. This is the main concern that guys point out because it's the most distressing. It basically means that your dick only works to pee. That's it. Weight gain and feminine fat depositions and gynecomastia. Estrogen is not the only thing that contributes to gynecomastia. Progesterone and prolactin are also implicated. So it is crucial to run blood testing for pregnenolone. Marek do it, which is fantastic. Ideally, pregnenolone sulfate due to the longer half-life and more stable uh, concentrations before anyone supplements with pregnenolone. The, if, if you're only going to remember one thing from each category from this, if your attention span is already lost, do not take pregnenolone unless you get a pregnenolone blood test. Regardless of what people say on the internet, get a blood test, and then at least you have your baseline level but it's very important to understand. And again, I'm just going to reinforce this one point. Pregnenolone deficiency symptoms can also be caused by psychological stress and psychological anxiety. So not everything is a biochemical thing that you can biohack and fix, but the symptoms will mirror one another. So you need to run comprehensive testing and have your background assessed by a health coach or a practitioner who knows what they're doing. You cannot cherry pick the benefits of pregnenolone as much as people would like to. It's a fantastic neurosteroid. It's a fantastic nootropic. It's amazing for reducing anxiety. It has a fantastic feeling of well-being, systemic antioxidant, all these fantastic things. But if you take too much and you don't need it, you'll get side effects regardless of what you would prefer. Your body doesn't care. So many men who are not pregnenolone deficient, that's a typo, but are psychologically and physiologically stressed, such as chronic pain, malnutrition, other undiagnosed health issues, will experience some benefits and some side effects from taking pregnenolone. So I sleep better, I'm more relaxed, I'm more chill, but my dick doesn't work and I can't get out of bed in the morning and I'm growing tits and fat on my hips. You can't just then take drugs and medication to get rid of these side effects and keep this one, your body is sending you a signal. So if you need pregnenolone, you won't get side effects if you get the dose right. But if you take too much, you'll also get problems. So you start low and you work up and you test your levels. Often men supplement with pregnenolone unnecessarily, just based on reading stuff on the internet. You can buy it over the counter here in the States. You can't do that in Australia, so we don't have that problem. They will achieve supraphysiological levels of progesterone, which will act as an androgen receptor antagonist. So it will also block the receptor for androgens and it will inhibit 5-alpha reductase, resulting in anti-androgenic effects. Not what you want. So this is just in my experience. I found pregnenolone deficiencies tend to occur with levels lower than 50 nanograms per deciliter. Now, this is just in my experience. And when I say 50, it's because I had to put a line somewhere. You could be absolutely fantastic at 49 and you could be completely and utterly symptomatic at 51. So there is definitely margin either side, particularly if you have a different history. Oh, sorry, a history that uh, implicates pregnenolone deficiency, such as a head injury and trauma. But it's also important to note that pregnenolone levels move around a lot. So they'll change day to day. When in doubt, run another test. But a lot of the time, pregnenolone deficiency will come back as zero. And zero is zero. So in my experience, most of the time when guys are pregnenolone deficient, it's at zero. But if someone is above a 50 or 60 and has no symptoms, they definitely shouldn't take pregnenolone, in my opinion, because they are much more likely to have negative side effects. But that range, that cutoff may differ for different people. Some people may find it occurs lower than 70. Some people may find it occurs lower than 20. I think in my opinion, I put 50 as the quite a low point, just based on what I've seen. You can definitely have people who are symptomatic at a 60 or a 70, but as you edge closer to 100, I would steer clear. Men who supplement pregnenolone at higher baseline levels are just going to get side effects. But again, Feel free to give it a try, fuck around, find out, but gummy worm dick's not fun. And the most important thing to note with pregnenolone side effects, they fade pretty quickly, but they will linger for a while. So guidelines from websites like Life Extension say that you should have optimal pregnenolone levels at like 200 nanogram per deciliter plus. This is just bullshit. 
and it's not based on peer-reviewed interventional studies, they're just not tolerated. If you take if you're a practitioner and you take everyone's pregnenolone levels up to 200, they're not going to come back and see you. They're going to come to me to fix them because this causes side effects. So these random numbers that people come up with, you know, just top quartile of whatever reference range people made up, this is too high. So more pregnant alone does not equal more benefits. Sorry. Uh, past the body's optimal point in the absence of disruption and aging, if it's not dysregulated, it's going to cause problem, not benefits. And it may cause some benefits, but it will cause more issues. Pregnenolone is best tolerated in a micronized format. This is very important. So when I first started working with pregnenolone, this wasn't something I was privy to, but micronized pregnenolone, whether you get it from a brand that makes micronized versions, um, MRM make a micronized version, Nutricology make a micronized version, I think Pure Encapsulations and Douglas Labs, but brands like Life Extension, I don't know who else make it in the States, maybe Jarodu, Now Foods or something. They're not micronized, so they're less bioavailable. They don't work as well, and they spike your levels too quickly and drop them off. So micronized means it's going to skip per first pass in the liver and get absorbed in your gut, which gives you like a semi-sustained release mechanism that more closely mimics natural production. So it works better, and this is also what you get when you get it prescribed. So anything prescribed will be micronized. Always, 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 when possible, use prescription, pregnenolone, DHEA, thyroid, et cetera. Yes, you can buy them on the internet, but get it prescribed. The, the quality is just better. So I recommend introducing pregnenolone if we're just going to put some numbers out here at 25 milligrams if someone's got an identified deficiency and 50 milligrams if the levels are undetectable. Now, there are different ways to skin a cat. You know, there's different roads that lead to the same destination. This is just what I found works pretty well. And titrating up by 50 to, or 25 to 50 milligram increments until you can get within the ballpark of 100. Now, your peak is going to be higher if you met, so your level is going to be higher if you measure at peak or lower if you measure at trough. So you've got to keep that in mind, but don't take levels through the sky just for the sake of it. And if you do take the levels too high, you will get those symptoms of excess. So DHEA, this is also classified as a neurosteroid, an adrenal hormone, a sex hormone, an androgen an estrogen, a precursor to testosterone. It's classified as a lot of things. It wears a lot of hats. You can call it what you want. So if pregnenolone and progesterone are yin, meaning like calming, then DHEA is yang, meaning fire and stimulating. So DHEA, to put it very simply, is your endogenous natural version of caffeine and facilitates a lot of dopaminergic and serotonergic pathways, as well as production of energy in the mitochondria. So it has a lot of mechanisms in common with caffeine, but one thing it doesn't share with the caffeine is the excess central peripheral nervous system stimulation. So it's like a really clean, good energy drink is what it feels like. So, and everyone's watching being like, oh, fuck yeah, I want some DHEA. So DHEA deficiencies are most commonly associated with age out of all the hormones that we mentioned today. DHEA will often increase under times of stress. And I know that Memo understands this very well. You guys are one of the very few clinics who understand this. So DHEA being high is not always a good thing. It can actually indicate that your adrenals are jacked due to chronic pain, psychological stress, or a, a deficiency in thyroid, which we're going to get to soon. So a lot of the time, DHEA will be elevated or high if someone is young as well. So if you're like 19, 20 and getting your DHEA levels checked, they're supposed to be high. That's not a bad thing. And they will decline as you get older. But they can also be dysregulated for the same thing as pregnenolone, which can be PTSD and head injuries. And all credit and a huge amount of credit here to Dr. Mark Gordon for identifying this. He has a great podcast, which has become difficult to find. I don't know why. Maybe the powers that be. Um, with a guy named Andrew Ma on Joe Rogan, where he specifically talked about how these things happen in the brain. So this was the foundation for what got me looking into this. So if you want to check out that podcast, it's a great one to look at. So correcting a DHEA deficiency will often improve stress tolerance. So it will physiologically improve your resilience. Uh, it will alleviate anhedonic depression. So DHEA can actually outperform SSRIs in a lot of trials for depression. That's not that impressive because SR SSRIs don't work that well but it is still worth noting and it can correct anhedonic behavioral patterns while improving sleep and exercise recovery. So this sounds great. So what I mean by correcting anhedonic behavioral patterns is if you really enjoy, let's say, I don't know, Marvel movies and like a, before they got shit and Avengers Endgame came out and like you're on like opening day and you're in the cinema, that's meant to release a whole bunch of dopamine and endorphins because you're 
doing something very pleasurable that means a lot to you that you enjoy. Conversely, if you just stare at a wall, your brain is not meant to release a bunch of dopamine. So what happens when you have a DHEA deficiency is that a lot of the mechanisms for converting the amino acid precursors like 5-HTP and tyrosine into serotonin and dopamine get downregulated. So DHEA is it's a precursor in this pathway. So if you're doing things that are supposed to feel good, or you know, another example is if you're hugging your friends, spending time with your family, spending time with your wife, and you're not really enjoying it, it's not really hitting the sides, it's because those things are meant to release serotonin. But if your body is deficient in DHEA, as well as other hormones, it won't actually make these, these proper neurotransmitter stimulants to make you feel what you're supposed to feel. So if the things that are meant to feel good don't feel good, you won't keep doing them. So you'll withdraw, you'll isolate from your friends and family, you'll stop engaging in hobbies, and then all of a sudden you're depressed because you're living a depressing life. So these behavioral patterns need to be corrected because we are creatures of reward. We are motivated by things that feel good, for better or for worse. But it's important that things that are supposed to feel good feel good. Otherwise, we will not do them. So resolving a DHEA deficiency will also improve sexual sensitivity and libido. A key symptom, not the only symptom, but a key symptom of DHEA deficiency in men is penile insensitivity and anorgasmia. Your dick goes numb, meaning that you can't reach an orgasm or it's very difficult, even if you're on your own or you're with your partner or you're doing whatever you're into. It doesn't get you over the finish line because it's actually less sensitive physically. So that's also a key one that comes up. And it's one of the reasons why older men lose interest in sex. One, their libido goes down because DHEA is very important for libido. And two, physically, it doesn't feel as good anymore either. So many men with DHEA deficiencies will also become insulin resistant. So DHEA is very important for insulin sensitivity. And DHEA has multiple pathways leading to fat loss, both directly and indirectly. It's very important for increasing your basal metabolic rate as well. DHEA has also been researched to prevent or be protective against many diseases of aging. I have to caveat this. I'm not a medical doctor, but it has been studied and been looked into for diabetes, cancer, dementia, osteoporosis, and osteopenia. Obviously, it needs to be looked into. It's not a panacea for those things. It's not a cure for all those things, but it, it has been studied to support the prevention and also in treatment of all of these conditions. So you'd be crazy not to take it, right? It sounds great. But again, just like pregnenolone, more DHEA does not equal more good. So mental screenshot of this, more DHEA does not mean more benefits. If it did, we'd all be taking it. So DHEA's far-reaching systemic and hormonal effects make it impossible to just cherry pick the benefits because it impacts so many other things. So many symptoms of low DHEA can be present with robust or even elevated levels of DHEA due to chronic disease states or improper diet and lifestyle practices. Increasing DHEA to super physiological levels is notorious for side effects. DHEA studies produce fantastic results and have very high dropout rates because it's not tolerated. It jacks people up, it makes them overstimulated, it causes insomnia. And one thing that actually gets noted a lot in the studies is it makes you stink. It changes the smell of your sweat and it makes it very strong. It's actually one of the highest reasons for DHEA dropouts. In studies where they give people DHEA in high doses, like 50 to 100 milligrams, who don't actually have deficiencies which is deliberately creating super physiological levels. So these super physiological levels will cause, as I said, increased sweating, insomnia, overstimulation, acne. Acne is a massive one. If you take DHEA and you don't need it, you will get horrific acne. So that's important to note. Change in sweat smell and sexual dysfunction. I think I put that in there twice. No, I didn't. Increased sweating as well. So it will also, again, if you're too cold and increases your basal metabolic rate, you'll have more energy. If you crank your DHEA through the roof, you're just going to sweat buckets and be uncomfortable. So inverse U-shaped response, upside down U. So this is also called the sweet spot or the Goldilocks zone, but this is the fancy medical term for it, inverse U-shaped response. So for example, if I stay up all night, because let's say I'm you know, staying at Ali's place and dealing with all her nonsense, I'm going to feel like shit. If I have a cup of coffee or maybe two, I'm going to feel a bit better, depending on maybe three. If I have 10 cups of coffee, I'm going to feel terrible, probably just as terrible as before I started, but a very different kind of terrible, both bad. So this is the same with DHEA, too little, bad, too much, bad, but very different types of bad. So 
while DHGA benefits can be argued mechanistically, we can argue mechanistic theory until the cows come home. DHGA is simply not tolerated in patients who don't have DHGA deficiencies. So when people go, well, DHGA has all these amazing benefits, so we want to take it to as high a level as possible because of blah, 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 blah. Cool, but it doesn't actually work out. It causes side effects. They feel terrible. The doctor tells them, hey, no, DHEA is great for you. It must be something else. And you end up seeing people like me or someone at Marrick Health who can look at this and go, hey, this is likely what's causing the problem. Always run labs. So here's some myths. And I cover all the myths around all these hormones in detail in the book, which was mentioned before. So exogenous testosterone administration reduces DHEA levels in the testicles. This is very true. This has been well studied. This study has been thrown around every forum that when you put someone on exogenous testosterone, pregnenolone goes down, DHEA goes down, progesterone goes down in the testicles. Absolutely. But not systemically. So DHEA may cause, again, a mild drop because we are fulfilling the next step in the pathway of testosterone and estrogens. Sure, the levels may drop a little bit, but a lot of the time they don't move. And a lot of the time they'll actually go up. DHEA can increase when you put exogenous testosterone in. So it throws the whole theory out. There will always be exceptions to the rules. So if someone's sitting there being like, well, my DHEA levels halved when I started testosterone, so this guy's full of shit. There will always be exceptions in this, especially with this. There are more outliers than anything else I've ever worked with. But it doesn't mean that everyone's DHEA deficiency, a DHEA deficiency will occur in everyone who starts TRT. And that's the most important thing with this. It's not black and white. Yes, you may have a deficiency or no, you may not have your levels moved, but it's very important that it could be either or it could be somewhere in the middle. And that's why we always run all these labs on everyone to make sure we know everything that's going on. Other clinics who don't do that don't do it because they don't know what they're doing. So DHEA is predominantly made in the adrenal glands for systemic function. So DHEA, if we have to label it something, which we just make up labels, but if we have to label it something, it's an adrenal hormone. So it can be regulated by anabolic steroid use. This is something I spoke about at the Olympia. So if you do a massive cycle, particularly with things like nandrolone, with different story, you're impacting so many more systems in the body. But for the context of optimal physiological levels of testosterone on TRT, it is not something that will give you a DHEA deficiency. So again, many men find out they're DHEA deficient after starting TRT. So they didn't check their levels beforehand and then they started TRT and then they find out, oh, my DHEA levels are low. This was caused by the testosterone. This is called uh, correlation does not equal causation. And it's also important to note that a lot of the time that DHEA was low for the same reason that the testosterone was low, especially if the issue is secondary. So where there's smoke, there's fire. So DHEA levels will drop with age. This is another point. So someone's like, well, I've been on TRT for 10 years and my DHEA levels are 30% lower than before I started TRT. It's because it's been a decade and they would have dropped regardless. So again, correlation. Another one, HCG increases DHEA. Doesn't in practice very much. HCG can do all kinds of stuff. I've seen HCG double people's testosterone levels. I've seen it barely move it. So it could increase DHEA in some people. Absolutely. But it is not something that causes a net increase in DHEA for everyone. And I've got a whole separate section in the book on all the myths around HCG. But at the end of the day, you do not need HCG to make DHEA anywhere outside of the testicles. So if you have a DHEA deficiency and you add in the HCG dose we use with TRT, which is generally within the ballpark of about 1,000 units per week divided in different dosing schedules, that will not fix the DHEA deficiency. It doesn't. And this has been studied to show that it doesn't work either. And it just doesn't in practice. So it debunks a lot of these myths. But again, it's important to note, there's just individual variation, we got to test everyone and see where we're at. So HCG does not increase DHEA to a significant degree when used in adjunct for TRT. If you're taking 1500 units three times a week for a fertility protocol, which is not how I'd recommend you do that. I recommend using FSH and a lower dose of HCG, which is covered in the book. Maybe Stephen, if he thinks this webinar is not terrible, he'll bring me back for part two and we can we can go through that in detail. But it's important to note that just pumping yourself with massive doses of HCG is not the best fertility protocol available at the moment. So all men on TRT should supplement with DHEA for the anti-aging effects. 
I would say that most men over the age of maybe 65 or 70 should, because they are most likely going to have deficient levels. But no, this is not a rule of thumb. You only take DHEA if you have a deficiency. You can't cherry pick the benefits. And again, you can take it and find out if you want to, but it is going to produce side effects that I mentioned before. Avoid suffering. So men wanting to optimize their DHEA levels naturally, which should be the first thing that you look at if you have a deficiency going, okay, why may it be low? Can we fix this? Diet, lifestyle, and sleep, particularly the intake of fat-soluble nutrients like A, E, D, and K. It's important to note, though, that not every condition causing secondary hypogonadism can be fixed, or it's not something that can be fixed overnight. Some people are very far off track and need help getting back on track. So it's also important to note that if you resolve the root cause of the low DHEA over time, you may not need the DHEA anymore, and then you may not tolerate it. It's why we don't just get your TRT dose and hormone replacement therapy dose right, and then just say, cool, let's never run blood work, see you never. We do reviews to check where you're at, because as your health changes, you may no longer need the things that you once did to support your health. So DHEA dosing varies a lot patient to patient, both in serum levels and response to milligrams of DHEA administered. In practice, to restore DHEA levels to resolve a deficiency without inducing side effects, generally 25 to 50 milligrams, again, micronized is what is needed. Some guys need five or 10 only. Some guys need up to 100. Generally, guys need less milligrams of DHEA than pregnenolone, but varies person to person. DHEA is best administered in the morning I know that there's a study that says that DHEA at night will improve growth hormone secretion. Sure, but it messes with people's sleep. So DHEA can be measured at peak or at trough. Again, I'm just putting numbers in here just for the sake of putting numbers in. It can vary, but four micromole per liter or below is about what I find shows deficiency symptoms. But again, people can be in the threes and feel fantastic. Varies person to person. And if you're measuring levels at peak, you probably want to get a level of, of about seven to 10 is what I've found works best or a bit low, lower middle range, maybe a five or a six at a 24 hour trough. I'm going to blast through the thyroid section because I've been talking for like 40 minutes. So hypothyroidism is poorly understood and often overlooked in men. So subclinical hypothyroidism is often diagnosed as depression, anxiety, chronic fatigue syndrome, and inattentive ADHD. Hypothyroidism and hypogonadism share the majority of negative symptoms. So if you look at a list of hypothyroid symptoms and you look at a list of hypogonadism symptoms, they're going to be much of muchness, but it's often overlooked by TRT clinics. This will cause a slow metabolism. It reduces your basal metabolic rate and it reduces your ability to put more energy out when you train. So hypothyroidism can be secondary, just like hypogonadism. It can be caused by poor diet and lifestyle. And this creates a vicious cycle where you feel shit. So you do things that aren't good for you. And the things that aren't good for you make you feel shit and it repeats. So this exacerbates the problem and it leads to exercise avoidance, stimulant abuse, low threat, low stress tolerance. And this leads to avoidance and low self-esteem and hedonism. This can be something particularly harmful with a lot of guys who are hypothyroid and undiagnosed is they don't have the energy to take on the world and do the things that everyone around them is doing. So not only do they not get to where they should be going, they see everyone else having more energy and excelling beyond them. And then they can often just go, okay, I'm not going to try at these things. I'm just going to go for the short term instant gratification reward. And this can then create this vicious cycle. So if you're lucky to get a diagnosis, you'll be put on probably T4 monotherapy, which is not a good approach. So T3 is your body's primary energy metabolic hormone. It is the furnace of the flame, what I call it. Sorry, it is the flame, the thyroid's the furnace. T3 is the flame. So a low energy body and a low energy brain will be depressed. That is the clinical definition of depression, low energy and sedative. So stress is defined as not having enough X to do Y. I don't have enough money to pay my bills. Don't have enough uh, intelligence to answer a question. Don't have enough of what you need to get done what you need to do. So the body will kick into a backup energy supply called stress. This is your sympathetic nervous system. This is your fight or flight response. Works great day to day, not so good chronically over time. We know the effects of chronic stress are devastating. So many men with hypothyroidism, again, are wired and tired. The engine's too small for the car. And you feel yourself being this car. And before I get into too many car analogies, I'm going to save that for the Silverback Summit. The whole lecture is on cars, the movie. So thyroid is a major lever for dopamine transmission. 
similar to testosterone. It causes more dopamine in, more dopamine out. It gives your brain capacity to make more dopamine, but it doesn't just piss it out for no reason like amphetamine does. This is why so many symptoms of uh, hypothyroidism are psychological. Men run hotter than women, so the primary symptom is not cold hands and feet in men. It can come up, but generally it's psychological issues relating to things not feeling good. I'm going to read you a section from my book here. So many patients with undiagnosed and untreated or undertreated, like T4 monotherapy, hypothyroidism, struggle with focus and attention, as well as performing other tasks related to the prefrontal cortex, impulse control, emotional regulation, and attention to detail. When we are in a low energy state, the body will actually upregulate adrenaline function to compensate, leading to a hair trigger fight or flight response that will manifest as a chronic state of generalized anxiety. This wired, tired, and overwhelmed and low energy state can lead to avoidant behaviors, procrastination, as well as guilt and low self-esteem. This is what a lot of younger guys are dealing with. So individuals with hypothyroidism have a lower basal metabolic rate, meaning they burn less calories than they should at rest, as well as when they exercise. So this means that exercise feels difficult and more stressful than it should. No matter what diet or fucking macro protocol you follow, you just can't lose weight unless you crash diet. These are the individuals which give up on their diet and exercise protocols and personal trainers will chastise them for saying, you're failing because you didn't track your source properly in my fitness pal, because their basal metabolic rate is way lower than they think. So it's crucial to evaluate whether the thyroid issue is primary or secondary. If the body is naturally suppressing the thyroid production due to a secondary root cause, adding more thyroid in on top is like pumping the gas when your body is pumping the brakes, not going to work out well. So this is why it's imperative to always test, not guess. That's my motto. I actually took that from Chris Cresser. It's his motto. Uh, running TSH, free T3, and free T4 alone can often not paint the whole picture, which is why thyroid antibodies, reverse T3, cortisol prolactin, uh, DHEA, and testosterone, as well as evaluating lifestyle, chronic injuries, psychological stresses, are important for getting a picture of a patient's full symptomology and thyroid dysfunction. It's more complex. So I'm going to go through two atypical thyroid presentations that don't commonly get talked about, but I see come up all the time. So High TSH, high T3, moderate T4. And if we're going to talk high, I mean top of the range T3 and maybe TSH of 2.5 to maybe like a 4 or 5 if they're unlucky. So this needs to be further diagnosed by checking reverse T3, cortisol, and prolactin to show, okay, what's going on with this individual's stress? Are they just basically cranked out? This can be due to chronic pain, particularly intractable chronic pain, which means it can't be resolved and needs to be treated. So sleep apnea will also do this prolonged extreme physical uh, psychological stress so people going through you know brutal relationship breakdowns people who've had someone close to them die divorce these things will do it as well or crash dieting we know what crash dieting does to metabolism people have heard of things like reverse dieting that's something that can undo this as well if that's the cause so if you put in more t3 and ndt this can often fix some problems but then also cause negative symptoms because your body is pumping the brakes and you're pumping the gas so you'll move forward but not in a clean, smooth fashion. So when it comes to alternative treatments, what you want to do is ideally resolve the stressor. So get out of the shitty relationship or you know, fix your bullshit, whatever needs to be fixed. But some of these things can't be resolved. You know, bulging discs, issues with surgeries, all kinds of stuff. People can't get out of chronic pain like that overnight. So I like to start with stress modulation supplements, CBD oil, phosphatidylserine. I've done a whole lecture on the combination of those two on YouTube. Glycine and magnesium. These are all very well tolerated. Uh, keep exogenous thyroid medications to a minimal amount. So you may still need to use some NDT or T3, but you want to use a small amount and then try to bring the stress down as well. That's a very good way to do it because it will increase the metabolism. It will also help the individual feel better and it will produce less side effects. And as I said before, always test for a pregnant alone and DHEA deficiency too. Second one is subclinical Hashimoto's. I don't know if this is a technical term or not. If it's not, I made it up. But what this is in terms of when we're looking at labs is, again, elevated TSH. T4 can be anywhere. And generally, T3 will be on the lower end, but not completely crashed out. But you have presence of hypothyroid symptoms. And antibodies are present. They're not zero, but they're not through the roof above the reference range. So in this case, treatment with low dose NDT or T3, T4, I prefer NDT, but some guys only have access to T3, T4. You guys have NDT, which is fantastic. 
can potentially, and this is this is so important, this can potentially prevent the inevitable development of full-blown hypothyroidism and the consequence, consequential detrimental impact to mental and physical health. So if you know that Hashimoto's is around the corner, you don't need to wait a decade or so for the patient to become completely depressed, obese, living a terrible life as a result of this. You can start to support their thyroid now because if it's already subclinical and there are symptoms and there's low T3, you don't need to wait for the wheels to fly off the car before you go to a mechanic. You know that they're going to fly off. So as soon as the check engine light comes on, you take the car to the mechanic. I like cars. So autoimmune thyroid dysfunction is volatile. Hashimoto's is a pain in the ass to work with. So you have to start low and go slow. A lot of the time people with Hashis want to feel better straight away. I get that. But it takes them time to adjust to the medication and their thyroid function will be much more volatile day to day. So start low, go slow. If it feels like if they come back in you know six weeks and they go, oh, this is barely doing anything, cool. No side effects. Give it time to work up in gradual increments because if you overshoot, even if they're you know gun ho to get to the finish line, body doesn't care. You're still going to get side effects. So work up gradually when Hashimoto's is present. And if in doubt to go up by half a grain or a grain or a quarter of a grain or half a grain, go for the lowest one and then increase it again in eight to 12 weeks. So subclinical hypothyroidism can be caused by hypogonadism. And hypogonadism can also cause issues with the thyroids. This is confusing. So if someone's got Hashimoto's, they've got Hashimoto's. But a lot of the time, people have low testosterone and subclinical low thyroid function. It's good to treat the lowest hanging fruit first. Thyroid is less invasive, but testosterone, fixing a testosterone deficiency can resolve the subclinical hypothyroidism. So I like to go in with testosterone first and follow up to look at the thyroid unless we're dealing with Hashimoto's. If the Hashimoto's is full blown and the hypogonadism is borderline, a lot of the time fixing the Hashimoto's will actually resolve the hypogonadism. But if the testosterone's gutted out and Hashimoto's is present, you may need to do both at the same time. It's case by case. It's not straightforward. So it is vital to evaluate a full comprehensive hormonal and metabolic panel before initiating TRT, not rocket science. Glad you guys do it. Most people don't. As resolving and treating Hashimoto's first can actually resolve a patient's need for TRT and it's less invasive and it's not going to be something that's going to shut down their testicles for the period of the treatment, which is ideal. So it's common for men to be troubleshooting TRT because they've got undiagnosed thyroid dysfunction. Google T3 aromatase. T3 is one of the main things that regulates your uh, your aromatase production. So when guys go, oh, I'm a genetic over aromatizer, it's very possible that you could have Hashimoto's. Um, so T3 is very, very important for a lot of the body's functions. And a lot of the time guys are trying to troubleshoot and tweak and mess around and take supplements and do whatever. And in reality, they're just actually trying to fix the hypothyroid symptoms. So always check the thyroid. Diet and lifestyle is always the lowest hanging fruit. Fix that. It impacts everything. But not all diet and lifestyle issues can be resolved without an intervention. Some people need help. If you're really far off track and someone goes, look, if you just lost 100 pounds and you know stopped drinking every night and got your life together and got rid of your sleep apnea, you feel great. Cool. How the fuck do I do that? So some people need help getting back on track and intervening with something like thyroid to help increase their energy, help lose body fat in response to exercise. As long as the dosing is done right, it's a fantastic thing that can help people because it's bioidentical. So you're working with the body, not on the body. So hypothyroidism and secondary hypogonadism, if it's induced by intractable chronic conditions, as I said before, you still need to treat it. It's just more difficult. So correcting thyroid dysfunction will put the wind in the sails of TRT and it will result in the biological and psychological effects to help patients get to where they need to go. If you have more energy and you feel better, you're more likely going to do the things you know you should be doing and stop doing the shit you know you shouldn't be doing. And then that as a result of doing that over time, that's what you need to do to get to the end goal of where you need to go. So many undiagnosed hypothyroid patients, as I said before, have low self-esteem, they're overweight, they're chronically stressed, and they've adopted this defeatist mental attitude due to living their whole life in a low metabolic state. If you fail diet and exercise 10 times, you're not going to be gun ho to go the 11th time. That's pattern recognition. You've learned. 
But this is very sad because a lot of the time people have this underlying dysfunction that's been overlooked and they think it's because they're a lazy piece of shit who can't you know, stick to the things they need to do. So it's very important that you've got someone like you know the team at Marek who can go through all your blood work, go through how you're feeling and help you understand and fix the biological issues that can be messing with the foundations of your health and, and your trajectory of your life. So as I said before, a lot of the time people want to rush to the finish line. It doesn't work with thyroid. It's easy to overshoot. Move up by increments of 30 to 60 milligrams of NDT at a time, waiting eight to 12 weeks and titrating up each time. I see a lot of the time patients are uh, uh, begun on two grains of NDT or even three grains of NDT. They just produce side effects. It doesn't mean the treatment wasn't right for them. It doesn't mean they didn't need two grains, but they might've needed six months to adjust to one. So start low, go slow. Body temperature can be a useful proxy for thyroid function but it is an imperfect proxy and it's more of a symptom than a diagnostic. It can be very impacted by gut health. So the ranges for T3 can be confusing online because this, the range that a lot of the time they use in the States is two to four picogram per mil. And in Australia or the UK, we use three to roughly seven picomol per liter. So if someone's like, oh, my T3 is four, that looks very similar, right? But it could mean two completely different things. Whereas if we're looking at testosterone numbers that are in the tens and twenties or the hundreds and thousands, it's very obvious which one we're dealing with. So you've got to know what, what units you're working with. So just like testosterone, there's not a set number. There is lab work and symptoms involved. So presence of hypothyroidism, especially with a repeat TSH of greater than 2.5 needs further investigation. Doesn't mean you have hypothyroidism, means someone needs to look into it. The general rule of thumb is that elevated TSH means your body is demanding and asking for more thyroid hormone, but this feedback mechanism doesn't always work. You can be hypothyroid with a low TSH, which is why you have to pull all the labs. So ideally, T TSH on paper should be between like 0 0.3 and 1.5. Again, if it's 1.6, that's not a problem. But this fluctuates a lot day to day and more so with Hashimoto's. So make sure that when in doubt, run another test. Titrate up slow, as I said before, and when in doubt, give it a bit longer, run an extra lab test or move up in a smaller increment. Always test, not guess. And as I said before, know if your clients or your patients are measuring their thyroid labs at peak or at trough right after they take the medication or right before, because they will produce different serum levels of T3. That's all. <laughs>